Ladies and gentlemen, step right up, because today we geek out about Barker's Row. Hey guys, what's going on? It's Lee from Geek City USA here, and today we're going to talk about a game called Barker's Row. Now, Barker's Row is a game in which you play Barker's at a carnival sideshow circus kind of thing, and you're trying to attract rubes or people to your grandstands based on the attractions that you have. Uh, now, this game is a very, very theme-heavy game. Uh, it looks very, if, if you think carnival and circus sideshow like I do, I think kind of creepy and eerie and Ripley's Believe It or Not-ish. And this is definitely, definitely fits that mold. So check it out over here. I'm going to show you kind of how the game plays and then give you an overview of a few turns. And then I'll come back and I will give you my thoughts on the game. All right, ladies and gentlemen, step right up and check out Barker's Row. All right, so this is Barker's Row. Now, first of all, check out the theme. The theme is fantastic. I know I said that already, but the theme is just awesome in this game. This is the play mat. So this doesn't actually come with the base game. Um, this was an add-on that I purchased through the Kickstarter, so just heads up on that. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be available after the Kickstarter. I, I imagine it probably will be, but uh, I think it definitely adds a lot of flair to the look of the game. All right, so the goal of this game is to be the first player to attract 13 rubes to your grandstand. So these are your rubes, and if you look here, they're all different. They're screen printed, and each, uh, there's a, a bunch of different designs. There's a couple of duplicates. Obviously, you know, you might get four or five of each one, or six, I don't know how many, but they're, they're pretty neat. Uh, and then these are your grandstands here. So in this example, I've set this up for two players. So you have a green player, and a red player. All right, in order to get rubes to your grandstands, you need to have attractions in order to entice them to come visit you. So what are attractions, you might ask? Well, I'm glad you asked that. So attractions are these cards here. They say attractions on them. And these are also, these are in the sleeves uh, that were part of the Kickstarter as well. The uh, actual art on these cards is very similar. Uh, so I'll show you, which I actually like the art on the card well, I don't know. I like the old school Edison bulbs. But anyway, I digress. So these are your attraction cards. Now at the start of the game, each player is going to be dealt five of them, and they are going to choose three to keep. Now if you notice, there are different suits. You have here oddities, you have beasts, you have horrors, and this here is freaks. And if you look down here, it will uh, line up with each one of these categories here. And then you have a wild category, which wild is, is exactly what wild is in other games. It's a whatever you want it to be suit. So you would pick three attractions at the start of your game, and then your goal is to score these attractions. Now, the next question is going to be, how do you score the attractions? I'm so glad you asked that. If you look here, you have, these are the Barker cards on this side, and this is your midway. And as the game goes on, you will be moving Barker cards to the midway. So for example, as the game goes on, when these cards are moved, like this is an oddities card, that'll go in the oddities spot, this is a wild, this is a wild, uh, this is a horror. And then these are the points that you use as a community uh, in order to pull uh, pull rubes or actually in order to score your attractions. So for example here, I have this oddity card and I, I can look here and I need to score, I need four points to score. So I can look and on my turn I can say okay two, three, four. So I can take the oddities and the two wilds and then I can score this attraction. And this attraction then becomes the bewildering, extraordinary, magnificent Crystal Skull, a glimmer you won't forget. Now, I have to, I have to say that this game is all about uh, immersing yourself in the theme. So if you and your friends or whoever you're playing with, you add on this bit and make sure you read these, it definitely adds a lot of depth and enjoyment to the game. It's, it's the little things that count. So anyway, you would take those and then you could then score this attraction and you would put it in front of your grandstand. Now, obviously for the sake of space here, uh, I don't have very much room, but that would sit in front of your grandstand. And if you score it, you would add two rubes on the seats on your grandstand. Now, how did we know that I only needed four points to score? Well, that's a good thing you asked that as well. Right here, we have the strongman tower. And if you look, it goes from the number four all the way up to the number 10. And there are uh, 
holes here for each of the color markers to go. Now at the start of the game, it costs you four points to score anything. So in this case, green scored at four points. So now I would move this up and the next time that green wanted to score a card, they would need five points. Now red still needs four, so it's possible that green could be up here needing seven points, whereas you know red will be able to score sooner. Uh, I appreciate this method because this is a built-in catch-up mechanism, so that way one player can't really run away with the game. Because obviously as you're alternating turns, sometimes, especially in a two-player game, one player might end up with more of an advantage, and this kind of helps slow it down and even the pace up a little bit. So in addition, when you score these attractions, you will be able to use their uh, powers down here. So if you look here, this Crystal Skull has a power that you can play one card at a time from the Barker deck into the midway until you have played a wild card into the midway this way. So this is a power that you can use on your turn. So you would play the, um, or score the attraction and put it in front of you, and then later in that turn or in another turn, you can use this as, you know, as, the, uh, as the action. Once you do that, this card becomes retired and you place it behind your grandstand. Now, again, this still counts towards the rubes, so I think I knocked them over, but I would have these two rubes here, even with this attraction retired. So, and, and then some of these attraction cards are going to say, um, like this one right here, use when you have fewer attractions on your stage than each other player. So the front here is your stage and the back is retirement. So some of these cards might say if you have a certain number of cards in retirement, uh, you can add a rube or take a rube from your opponent and, and stuff like that. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of clean everything up here and I'm going to give you a brief example of how the game would flow. And that way you can get an idea for how the how the Midway and the Barker cards work. Let me take these guys off because they ran away, they're scared. All right, so we're gonna start, and each player would get three Barker cards. Or I'm sorry, would get three attraction cards. So this is a red player, and I'm not gonna bother reading what these are. You'll, you'd wanna read through these and figure out which one is, is the best one for you. Um, but I'm just going to look and I'm going to say, I'm going to pick three different ones because initially you kind of want to diversify your hand so you can work towards building different things. Because if I had all oddities in my hand, say for example I had all this kind of card in my hand and no oddities ever came up on here, well that would really, uh, that would put me behind. Not to mention if I have all oddities, as soon as I scored an oddity card, this would be blank and then I would not be able to play these other two. So I would just say, let's pick these three. We'll pick one of the beasts, one of the freaks, and one of the oddities, and I will set that down in my hand. And then, just set these cards aside for now. Uh, player, or green guy would be able to take three, and I've got too many cards here. So we'll just keep these three for the, oh, these four, these three for the green player. And you would usually put the unselected attractions, you could put them back in the deck or on the bottom, like so. All right, now on a turn, uh, there's three actions that you do. So first of all, the, the thing you must do is move an attraction card or, or move a Barker card into the midway. So what that looks like is as the red player, again, I'm gonna look at my hand and I'm gonna see, okay, I have oddities, I have freaks, and I have beasts. So I'm hoping to find a card that would match one of those suits. And you can see here what the suits are ahead of time. So you don't know what their value is, but you can at least see what the suits will be. So in this case, let me say I'm going to try and score my oddity. So I'm gonna take this card, this Barker card, and I'm gonna play it into the, uh, into the midway. So I would flip that over, and I just put a card worth two points, if you can see that, two points into the midway. And then on, on Red's turn still, I have a choice. I can score an attraction, which, Right now I need four points to score an attraction at the start of the game. I don't have four points, that's just two points. And I don't have any attractions in my stage, so I can't use the attraction power. So that would be the end of my turn. Now you would take the top card of the deck here, and that would immediately fill the blank in the Barker, uh, in the Barker section. If at any point during the game, if these three suits match up, so let's say I have three whores here, I can choose instead to shuffle these, to remove these from the game and put three cards in their place. And the same thing goes if you end up with three attraction cards. If I have three attraction cards that are the same suit and I, and I so choose, I can show them to everybody and then shuffle them and get new ones. 
So like on, to, on now to the green player's turn, we're gonna look here and I'm gonna say, ooh, that's good. I have an oddities card. Uh, I wanna try to build off that, but there's no oddities here. So I'm going to play a wild card. I'm gonna take a wild Barker card and play it to the midway. Oh, look, that's awesome. So this Barker card has a one plus. That means I get to draw another card and put it into the midway. So that card goes there and then this immediately takes its place. Now, because that was the one plus, I get to take another card. Now again, I really, really wanna make this oddities card work because there's already two points there. So now there's three points total on the board with that wild card. So I'm going to take this other wild card and play it here, and that gives me another point. So now that's the end of my moving the Barker card to the midway portion of my turn. Now I can score an attraction and use an attraction power. And I can do this as many times as I'm able to on my turn. So I'm going to score this attraction. So I'm gonna go ahead, currently, this is the start of the game, so this would be at four. So currently, I need four points in order to score that attraction. So I will take two, three, four. We have four points total here. And this is my attraction. So I now have the baffling, magnificent, electrifying temple idol found among the jungle ruins. And if I choose to play this first power, draw five cards from the Barker deck, choose two to play into the midway, and discard the other three. And I can put that in my stage, and I'm just gonna kinda put it like this. These cards will get discarded, and I will get two rubes to add to my grandstand towards my total of 13. Now, I only have two attraction cards left in my hand, so I'll go ahead and draw up to a third one. And then, uh, I don't want to play that action right now, so it would go over back to the red player's turn. So the red player, kind of a bummer. Oh, yeah, before I forget. So the, the strongman tower. Green now moves up to five on the strongman tower. And what that means, like I said, now green needs five points to score another attraction. So red still only needs four points to score an attraction. So we're going to take a look at red. Red's bumming here because red has a whole lot of nothing to deal with. So we're going to take, I have a Freaks here, so we're going to take this Freaks card and ah, I got a two. Okay, so a two goes into the Freaks column. The Oddities card will move there. And I don't have uh, enough points to play an attraction or to score an attraction. So we'll go over to the green player's turn. Now the green player, we're going to look at our cards again and see I have two beasts. Ooh, I have a Freaks and there's a wild. Let's see if I could do what I did last turn. So I'm going to take this wild card and flip it. Oh, it's worth one point which helps, but it also helps my opponent now because it's going to go back to them. However, I think as the green player, I'm going to do this action. I'm going to retire this uh, attraction and use its power so I can draw five cards from the Barker, or from the Barker deck, choose two to play into the midway, and discard the other three. Okay, so I'm going to draw one, two, three four and five and I can keep two by putting two into the midway so I'm looking here if we look at my hand I have a freaks attraction and I've got a couple of freaks here so I'm going to keep the two highest ones I will discard these three and I've now played these into the barkers uh, or into the midway these barkers into the midway and now so this guy's retired this temple idol is gonna go behind my grandstand, but I'm going to use what's on the table now to score my bearded lady. And I need five now because I, I already scored one at four. So what I'll do is I'll take the five that are in the freaks. So I have the confounding, unfathomable, one of a kind bearded lady, hair raising thrills. And I'm gonna take this card, put it in front of my grandstand on the stage, these are going to get discarded. I'm going to get two more rubes that are attracted to my grandstand. Right, one and two. And then I'm going to, again, move up on the strongman tower. So my next card play is going to cost me six. So now, again, red still only needs four. So even though green seems to be running away with the game right now, uh, scoring two attractions to red zero, it's gonna be a little bit more difficult as the game goes on for green to catch up. So now green can take another attraction to fill up the hand. And let's look at what this, uh, what this attraction power is. It says treat all one and one plus cards on the midway as two cards until the end of your turn or until you score an attraction, whichever occurs first. So I could use this card, even though it's a one, 
as a two if I wanted to use this action. Uh, I don't want to use that action, so that's going to end my turn, and we'll go back to the red player. So now red, once again, will look at his cards and say, I'm losing miserably right now, and I'm bumming, so, oh, but look, there's an oddities card. So I'm going to play the oddities into the uh, midway. And that's pretty good for that, for the red player, worth two. Uh, but we still don't have enough. There's only three points total on the board between the wild and the oddities, so I can't score cards, so we're going to go back to green. Green will look here. And again, I have two beasts and a freaks, and eh, nothing I can do, so I will just play a horse card. Oops, you know what though? I take that back. I never did fill this back in. So, because I have two beasts, I'm gonna play this beast card. So I will take this, and this is a two, and I will play it into the beasts area here. And, uh, well, this isn't gonna do me any good still. So that would be the end of my turn. We'll replace this card, and we'll go back to the red player. Red player still not winning. There's still not enough here, I should say, to do anything with, but there's a beast card. Maybe we can get what we need, and we should be able to here. So I take this beast here. It's worth one, so there's now three. We can fill that one up immediately. And now we look here, and finally, red's going to score something. Red only needs four to score, so I have the beast here. Here's three points in beast card, and here's a wild, whoops. So there's my four, and I have the extraordinary, humongous, ferocious, giant leech. It'll really suck you in. So this is cool. So now Red has just scored their first attraction, so this will go on the stage. They will take two rubes from the pile, creepy balloon guy and creepy Russian nesting doll looking guy. And you can put them on two of the spots in Red's area. Red will immediately draw an attraction to replace the one in its hand, in their hand. And Red also moves up on the strongman tower. So now the next time it's gonna cost Red five in order to score uh, another attraction. Now let's see, does the power on this attraction do anything for us? Use when you have fewer attractions on your stage, including this one, than each other player, and take one rube from the crowd. So that would have helped me if the green player didn't retire the temple idol. However, they only have one on their stage, so I can't use this yet, but on a future turn, I'd probably be able to, and then could take an extra rube from the crowd. And you will go back and forth and back and forth and continue until somebody gets 13 rubes. Now, once somebody gets 13 rubes, the game is over and it ends immediately. And that, in a nutshell, is how to play Barker's Row. All right, guys, that was Barker's Row. Now, the theme on this game is fantastic. This game does a great job at implementing just the smallest details from the 3D grandstands to the 13 rubes, which I just thought 13 was kind of obviously catchy for a creepy sideshow. Uh, you have the strongman tower, the screen printed meeples, the thematic cards, a, a lot of attention to detail went into this game. The art on this game does a great job at conveying the theme. Uh, the Barker cards are great in that they're kind of color coded to match whatever uh, grouping they go in. The attraction cards look good. Overall, the, the presentation of the game is great. All right, so let's talk about the components. So first of all, the play mat and the card sleeves, those are not a, a standard with the base game. You can add those on. Uh, and the, the play mat, great quality, uh, typical neoprene style mat, vivid colors, looks great. And the card sleeves as well. Now, I don't typically use sleeves on my cards, but these sleeves look looked really nice and they actually added a lot to the game. I, I like the way that they presented um, they weren't a standard sleeve in that you would look at and the one side was you know, colored and the other side was clear. Th th there was a great attention paid to uh, creating the sleeves and, and I thought they were great for what they were. The meeples are very well done, they're silk screen and it definitely the art on the silk screening of the meeples also fits the theme of the game. Um, each of the pictures, some are kind of creepy and, and, and goofy and it definitely, again, fits the theme of the game. The cards are of a nice quality, they're a nice linen finish. Uh, no complaints whatsoever. Now the grandstands, I know that there was some comments that there were some issues with the with the punch boards fitting together. Maybe they were a little loose. Um, I didn't have any problems with mine. There were some where like maybe one of the rows of seats or one of the sides would be a little loose and I just would switch that with another one and it, 
typically that resolved the issue. Now, it was kind of what I expected in dealing with a punch board uh, accessory. Like, I think Potion Explosion, that's a po uh, punch board as well. And I think there's always going to be some give. I mean, it's cardboard. And in the game, you know, once you have them set out, they, they sit, you're not moving them around. And I was not turned off by, by that at all. I thought they look good. They put together well. And I had no complaints myself. Uh, there was also some... Um, a little bit of commentary going back and forth on the strongman tower and that it was a little wobbly now there's a plastic piece that pumps that kind of pops through the bottom and then you stick the long part there's a little tab that goes into that plastic tab and as a result of that plastic piece being on the bottom there might be a little bit of wobble um, I didn't have again too much of a problem uh, the plastic piece held the cardboard in uh, firmly enough for me and then those little plastic pieces, uh, th they worked as well. It was easy to pull them out and put them on. So I had no complaints about it. Uh, maybe I'm a little easier going about that kind of thing, but I think the presentation looked good. Nothing was falling apart. I didn't get frustrated. And in fact, outside of putting, the, putting everything together the first time, I really didn't notice it. Um, you know, I, I do, every time I, one of us would play a card, you would pick up the uh, strongman tower to move it. So... Uh, it, it doesn't seem to be getting loose and we've got a number of plays in so again no complaints here I, I think it has worked out just fine. Alright now as for the gameplay uh, the game is really really easy to explain it's easy to pick up it's you know you're playing a card to the midway that's your your one move that everybody has to do and then you play whatever cards you can in your hand either you're playing an attraction or you're going to use the action of an attraction so it's it's a very easy game to pick up. Now I played with this with two players and I played up to the full four player count and I think this game definitely shines with more players. I think three to four players would be really the the sweet spot with the more the merrier. And the reason I say that is with two players, even though there's a catch up system, you can have a game that might go in the favor of another player so you typically the second player because the first player will play a card and then if the second player gets the right card draw on their first turn they might be able to play an attraction and then it the, gets back to the first player and they have no cards to work with and it's kind of wash rinse repeat until the catch-up mechanism and the the strongman tower kind of levels the playing field uh, it wasn't too much of a problem but I, I just felt that there wasn't as much interaction um, I mean there was interaction but it just kind of felt like uh, there could be a moment where somebody might get frustrated if they don't necessarily get a chance to do anything in the game. Now with the fuller player count, there's more cards that are going to live out on the midway. People are going to be going for uh, different categories of, of attractions. So there's a little more wiggle room. And then again, with the catch-up mechanism, it's really the game levels really quickly. Now this game is also a lot about who you play with because you can play this game as a standard card game and you'd have a good time with it, no problem. Cruise through a game in no time. However, where this game really shines is if you play it with a group of people that really have fun calling out the attractions that you're playing. The one of a kind, stupendous, creepy, bearded lady. It, that just, it, it helps to immerse you in the theme and it makes the game a lot of fun and we had a lot of loud moments and a lot of just entertaining laughs and everything. And this makes for a very fun, lighthearted uh, game night game. So all in all, if you're a fan of the theme, I think it's definitely worth checking out. I would probably push to play it with more players. Again, you could have fun with two players, but I, I would would recommend playing this with three or four players to get the full experience of the game and again play this with people that you can have fun with if you're if you got a, a boring person in your game group uh, don't play with them at all uh, make them go play monopoly with your neighbors get your your good friends over and i think you can have a really good time playing this game all right guys that's it this is lee from geek city usa thanks for hanging out with us be sure to comment down below let me know your thoughts have you played the game what are your thoughts on the game or if you have any questions about the game uh, also, be sure to like the video, subscribe, and, and you can get notified of whatever other games that we're reviewing and our Kickstarter videos and all that jazz, maybe some goofy fun stuff. Again, thanks for hanging out with us. I'm Lee, and we'll see you next time.